Let's be turning to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. After a quarter of 13 Sundays of thinking about the eldership, we have referred to 1 Timothy 3 several times, and you're probably reciting that passage in your sleep now. I know I am. Uh, but we're going to be thinking about just one verse there in 1 Timothy 3, verse 1. Let's read together. 1 Timothy 3, verse 1. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. That's from the New American Standard Version. The New King James says... If a man desires the position of a bishop, then it is a good work that he desires. I want us to think about that idea this morning, desiring to serve as an elder. The elders just made this somewhat informal announcement uh, during our Bible class hour, but for those who were not here because maybe you were teaching uh, one of the children's classes or, or something else, uh, let me just repeat what they said here. The elders are hoping soon to begin a selection process for appointing some additional elders to join the three that we currently have. And we don't have an exact date on that yet, but expect that to begin sometime in the month of October and maybe for this process to be wrapped up by the end of the year. Now, knowing that this was on our horizon several months ago, the elders and the preachers planned on having a Bible class for an entire quarter on the subject of the eldership, which, of course, we have just wrapped up that class this morning. We didn't feel like just a couple of sermons about the eldership was sufficient teaching to lead us into a selection process. We wanted to devote more time and more attention to that. But as with every subject that you preach on or, or teach a Bible class on even, you never completely exhaust everything that you want to say in your class. And so this morning's sermon is really an addendum to some of the things that Joe and I talked about in our Bible class this quarter on the eldership. This particular topic, a man's desire to serve as an elder, this was something that Joe and I kept coming back to saying, we've we got to get that in there somewhere, we've got to find a place for this, and yet we just never really found a good place for it. So we said, well, we can always do it in a sermon. So that's what we're going to consider this morning. If a man desires the position of a bishop, what does that look like? How does a man express his desire to serve the church and to serve the Lord in this way? How do we recognize that desire in a man? And I've got three things that I want to talk with you about this morning. And the first thing that I want us to consider is for those of you who are not elders, which is 99.99% of you. The first point is for all of us. Because the fact is, all of us are called to be servants of both God and man. And what I don't want you to do this morning as we think about this topic of desiring to serve in the eldership, well, that's not me. Click, I'm unplugging. This sermon is not for me. No, I don't want to do that. In fact, I, I don't like sermons that only appeal to like 0.01% of the congregation, right? So, so let's start off with our first point, saying some things that are there for all of us. Because the fact is, beloved, whether we are considered to be an elder one day or not, all of us must have a desire within us to serve God in whatever capacity we are able to serve. There are many people in our congregation who will never be considered for the eldership for one reason or another. Perhaps you won't be considered for an obvious reason. You're a female. Or maybe you won't be considered because you're not a married man. Or you are married, but maybe you are childless. 
And so the things that are listed in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 demand that elders be husbands and that they be fathers. And if you are neither one of those things, then you cannot obviously serve the church as an elder. But just because you can't serve as an elder doesn't mean you can't serve in some other way. And in fact, it is, it is incumbent upon all of us, whether we are considered for the eldership or not, to serve in whatever capacity we are able. Maybe the reason you won't be, concern, uh, you won't be considered as an elder it is not something so obvious. But there are still things for you to do in the kingdom and in this place. I want to share with you a quote from one of our elders that he wrote to me in an email. As we were making preparations for our Bible class this morning, we had some conversations going back and forth. And this is a pretty lengthy quote, so I've split it into two slides. But he said, At every stage in life, a servant of God should desire to serve to the extent of whatever capacity God has enabled him or her to serve. There is no shortage of things to be done. A woman should serve to the extent of the capacity with which she's been blessed. Young people should do the same. Single people should do the same. Widows and widowers should do the same. Sometimes people get caught up in regretting what they are unable to do because of circumstances or by God's design. God does not ask us to give what we do not have or serve in ways that we are unable he does not ask us to serve or give according to how things could have been under different circumstances. And that is exactly right, beloved. That statement from one of our elders is exactly right. There is room in this church for the work that all of us can do, whether we are considered for the eldership or not. The fact is, each one of us, male, female, young, old, new Christian, mature Christian. We have all been given gifts to utilize, and we must utilize those gifts as the New Testament teaches us. I'm going to Romans chapter 12. I want you to get your Bible and turn there with me. Romans chapter 12. What I really want to emphasize is verses 6, 7, and 8, but, but let's pick up verse 3 while we're here in this context. Romans 12 and verse 3. Paul says, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. This is an apostle of Jesus Christ writing this. An apostle. And you know from our Wednesday night apostles class, if you have been participating in that, that the apostles of Jesus were specially chosen servants of Christ. And they had gifts and abilities. They had abilities that no other people had as apostles of Christ. And so if anyone might have thought more highly of themselves than they should, it would have been one of the apostles. But Paul says, by the grace of God given to me, I am able to serve in the capacity that I can. And you too should not think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Because by the grace of God, you are able to do the things that you can do. The Apostle Paul could do some incredible things in the Lord's service. And yet he is encouraging all of us to be humble because it is by the grace of God that we are what we are. So in verse 6 then, he says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry or service, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Of those things that Paul lists, 
in verses 6 through 8, did you notice that only one of those things is miraculous in its nature? He mentions prophecy, and that's a miraculous gift that one would have in the first century. But all of the other ones, leadership, generosity, showing mercy, teaching, ministry, or service, those are not miraculous things. And Paul says that it is by the grace of God that we have both the gifts and the opportunity to use them. And so we must use them while we stay humble and not think of ourselves more highly than we should. Or how about 1 Peter chapter 4? Another apostle of Jesus Christ who writes the same thing. 1 Peter 4 verses 10 and 11. 1 Peter 4 and verse 10, as each one has received a gift. Both Paul in Romans 12 and Peter here in 1 Peter 4 say that each one has received a gift. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Don't these two passages read as parallel passages? The grace of God is mentioned. The gifts given to each one are mentioned. The opportunities to serve in whatever capacities we are able are mentioned so that God would be honored and glorified, that he would receive the praise and not we ourselves. We all have something to contribute and whether or not we are being considered for the eldership doesn't matter. I'm going to do what God has enabled me to do when God enables me to do it, as opportunities come along, let me serve as God gives me opportunity. Each one of us is to be learning and growing and maturing. And some of us are, of course, farther along than others because of age and because of maturity levels as a Christian. But like trees in a forest, we are all to be growing. We are all to be getting taller and stronger in the Lord Jesus. But as we think about selecting elders, as we look out amongst that forest of people who are growing taller and stronger, when we think about elders, we're, we're looking for some of those trees that have just gotten a little bit taller than the others. Some of those trees that are standing out at the present time. And I want to emphasize that expression. Some of those trees that are a little stronger, a little taller, a little healthier at the present time. Because what we know is that at a future time, there will be some other trees that are growing a little bit taller, a little bit stronger, a little bit healthier. There is room in the kingdom for all the work that all of us can do. So please do not tune out the rest of this lesson as we think about the elders. But let's move on and let's talk about this idea of desiring the work of an elder. And you can tell by what I've put on the screen that I am emphasizing the word work. If a man desires the position of a bishop, it is a good work that he desires to do. Let's emphasize that word before we talk about desire. The work of elders is work. I wish we could get out of our minds this idea that the eldership is, is just this board of directors for the church who meets together about once a month and they talk about the budget. They, they, they only talk about the financial considerations of the church. And so if I am appointed as an elder, it, it puts me in a position where where the board comes together and we pat each other on the back and we, we talk about how great it is to be on the board, but very little work is actually done. The elders are shepherding souls. 
And Joe and I spent so much time in our class talking about the work that elders do. We talked about this idea of shepherding. And we discussed how elders are seeking the straying, how they are binding up the wounded. They're tending to the needy. They're feeding the flock. They're getting the bugs out of the sheep's ears. Can I explain that one a little bit? I was reading a book about shepherding one time, like true shepherding, a man who spent his entire life growing up on his father's farm, tending his father's sheep. Then he took over the farm and they became his sheep. And he was talking about what is it to be a shepherd of sheep? And he was doing that so that he could then talk about the scriptures presentation of shepherds and sheep. And he said, you know, one of the biggest problems that sheep have is they get bugs in their ears. And he said, here's the thing. Sheep don't have fingers like us. You get something in your ear, you can reach in there and you can get it. He said, sheep don't have that. And there are these bugs that, that like to burrow inside the ears of the sheep. And it just drives them nuts. And you'll see them go up to a tree and they'll, you know, scratch their head against the tree because they're, they're itching and they're hurting and they can't get the bugs out of their ears. I thought this was really fascinating. I know that's weird, but I, I just thought it was interesting because when I first read... The big problem for sheep is they get bugs in their ears. I thought, what in the world is he talking about? And then he explained it, and I thought, oh, that makes so much sense. And he said, sometimes people in a church get bugs in their ears. Meaning, metaphorically, of course, they have problems in their life. They have challenges that they have to deal with. And they need the shepherd to come along and bring them up, lift up that ear, and dig in there and get the bugs out. The work of an elder is not a promotion to a cushy desk job. It is an invitation to pick up a staff and go out into the pasture. To get involved in the lives of members. To seek after those sheep who are wandering off. And, and those sheep who haven't come to services for a long time. and Find out what's going on. Or to check in on them when they're going through some difficulties in life. Being an elder is work. And at times, it is a very difficult work. Well, if that's the case, then why on earth should I desire to do this? Well, the answer is in Matthew chapter 9. And this is a passage that, again, we, we have referred to several times in recent weeks. Matthew chapter 9 this is speaking about the heart of Jesus as he looked out over the multitudes that were following him. And in Matthew chapter 9 and in verse 35, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of sickness and every kind of disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Jesus was moved with compassion as he is healing people whose lives have been crippled by disease. As he is teaching people, giving them eternal truths that their souls are so desperately seeking, Jesus sees these people are weary. These people have been run down. They have been discouraged and they need to be lifted up. They need to be fed. They need to be healed. And his compassion drives him to see these sheep and to see their needs. But not just to see them, to resolve to do something about it himself. So why would a man desire to be an elder? Because he looks out among God's people and he sees that men and women are hurting. He sees that they need direction, that they need good teaching, that they need encouragement to be everything that they can be in the Lord's service. And he sees children who need to be trained and taught and he wants to be a part of that. And he wants to help the church be at peace and thrive. The desire to be an elder comes from these same feelings that Jesus expressed in Matthew chapter 9. It comes from a love of other people's souls and a desire to meet their needs. I'm going to say something 
two times, but I'm going to say it in a different tone. And I'm hoping that you will sense the difference between the two. You see, as people look out into a church and they see the need for leadership, they might respond by saying this. Well, I guess somebody has to do it, so I'll do it. Or they might say, somebody has to do it, and I'm going to do it. You hear the difference in that? Elders look out over a church seeing the needs. And if they, by the grace of God, have come to a point in their life where they can meet the needs of God's people, then they will choose to say, I can do this and I should do this. And so I want to do this. Not every man will have a desire to serve as an elder. And there's nothing wrong with that. It is not a sin to not want to be in that position. A man should know his limitations. And so maybe, maybe a man feels that he cannot do the work for one reason or another. And that's okay. Let's go back to that elder's comment that I shared with you earlier in the lesson. That everyone must serve in whatever capacities that they feel that they are capable of serving. And for this present season, maybe you don't have the desire to do that because you don't think that you can do the work for some reason. And that's fine. In the future, your feelings, your thoughts may be different. It is not a sin to not desire the work. But there are some who will desire it because they see the need and they feel that they can meet that challenge. So how do you know then if a man desires the work? How, how, how do you know? I want to suggest to you that a man's desire is something that is shown rather than something that is spoken. It is shown, not spoken. You see, we're not looking for a politician here. We're not looking for a candidate who's going around campaigning for office. Vote for me. I'm going to do a great job. If you will just vote for me, I'll straighten everything out. You know, we're seeing a lot of that in the news, aren't we? Got a presidential cycle going up, uh, election coming up next year. All of these candidates are going around and they're saying, vote for me. I'm better than him. And here's why. And all of them are touting their abilities. They are talking about themselves constantly. They are always making promises, shaking hands, taking photos. They're telling everybody about their policy agenda, their plans for governance. They talk about their past records. They speak ill of other candidates. Oh, that guy doesn't know what he's doing. That woman's crazy. Don't vote for her. You should vote for me because I'm great. That's not what we're after. Let me show you something in the Old Testament. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 15. This has always been a, an interesting uh, story in the Old Testament life of, of David. 2 Samuel chapter 15. David's son, Absalom, is trying to take the throne away from his father. Absalom has this conspiracy that he is engaging in to, to remove his father from the throne and step in to that position. So in 2 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 1, Now it came about after this that Absalom provided for himself a chariot and the horses and 50 men as runners before him. You, you see, the king would have servants and soldiers. He would have this retinue of people who would be with him whenever he was traveling about, whenever he was going around on his different exploits and things among the people. He would go out and he would have this 
this large entourage of people with him because some of it was security, some of it was to show his power. Absalom gathers all of the things that you would expect the king to have. To put it in our modern parlance, what we would say as we're in this current political season, you know, you, you've got this man or this woman out there that, that we think might jump into the political race. They might throw their name in the hat as a candidate, but they haven't done it yet. But you start seeing rumblings of preparations that they're making. And so they start you know, having various speaking engagements at different places throughout the country. Maybe they write a book that just gets released. And, and, and we look at that and we say, ah, it looks like they're about to make a move. Looks like they're about to jump into the race. That's what Absalom's doing. So you continue in verse two. Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. And when any man had a suit to come to the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, from what city are you? And he would say, your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, see, your claims are good and right, but no one listens to you on the part of the king. Listen, my friend, you have a true and legitimate complaint. And you've come to bring your complaint to King David, but King David's not here to listen to you, is he? King David doesn't care about you. He's not concerned for your well-being, but I'm here listening. I'm here with you to hear what you have to say. Verse 4, moreover, Absalom would say, Oh, that one would appoint me judge in the land. Then every man who has any suit or cause could come to me and I would give him justice. And when a man came near to prostrate himself before him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. And in this manner, Absalom dealt with all Israel who came to the king for judgment. And so Absalom stole away the hearts of the men of Israel. What is Absalom doing? He is running for office. That's what he's doing. He's politicking. He is talking bad about the incumbent, old daddy David, David's not here to listen to you. King David's not concerned about you, but me, I'm here for you. I'll take care of all of your needs. And if I was the one on the throne, you wouldn't be having these problems. Does Absalom have a desire to be the king? Of course he does. How do you know that Absalom has that desire? Because he keeps going around telling everybody that. He's going around campaigning and politicking, using his political savvy to gain power. So if a man in a church were to go around and say, our elders, man, let me tell you what, these guys don't have a clue what they're doing. If I was in the eldership, though, here's what I would do. That man should not be anywhere near the eldership. Titus 1 and verse 7, passage about the qualifications of elders, says that elders are not to be self-willed. They're not to be self-willed. Would you say that Absalom is self-willed? Of course. He has an agenda. He has something that he is trying to push through, something that he wants to accomplish. And so Absalom doesn't need to be anywhere near the throne of Israel. Now listen, I, do I anticipate someone going around like Absalom and, and acting like that and, and trying to undermine existing eldership? No. I don't anticipate that, not in the least. But I'm trying to make a point with you. The point that I'm trying to make with you is, if someone is going around letting their desire to serve be known through their verbiage, be known through their words, vote for me, I'm going to do this, I have ideas, I'm going to push through what I want to push through, you better think twice. You better think 25 times about that man. 
Because that man is not the kind of man that we need. The fact is, the eldership is not a place for power-wielding politicians. It is a place for servants. Let's go to Luke's gospel. Let's go to chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. This is the night that Jesus will be betrayed by Judas. He is with his disciples. They are about to be engaging in the institution of the Lord's Supper together. And in Luke chapter 22, in verse 24, Jesus and the disciples have just had the Passover meal together. And while this happens, in verse 24, it says that there was also a rivalry among the disciples as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you Let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table, or he who serves the table? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. Now there's a lot going on here. As Jesus is entering these final hours of his life, his disciples are once again arguing about who's going to have the greatest position in the kingdom. And Jesus teaches so much here. He says, those who sit at the table, the ones who the food is brought out and set before them and and their glasses are poured by the servants. Who's greater, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves those who sit at the table? And the answer is obvious. The one who sits at the table is the one in position of authority and power over the servants who serve at the table. But Jesus says that the greatest of all Speaking of himself, the greatest in their presence is the one who will serve them. And right after Jesus says this, do you realize what he does next? Right after this, and you can read about this in John 13, Jesus speaks these words and then he gets up from the table, he walks over to a pitcher of water, a bowl, and some rags, and he washes the feet of his disciples. The greatest one at the table washes the feet of the others at the table. You see, this is what the eldership is about. It's not about power. It's not about pushing any agenda but the Lord's. It is not about pursuing whatever desires and interests that I have as a man on the eldership. It is about serving. It is about giving to the sheep the things that they need to make sure that their well-being is secured. So in James chapter 3, James chapter 3 will help us a lot as we think about a man's desire to serve as an elder. James 3 and verse 13. James begins with this question. Who is wise and understanding among you? Is there a wise and understanding person among you? How do you know that he is wise and understanding? Well, because he runs his mouth all the time. and He told us he was wise and understanding. That's not what James says. James says, let him show by good conduct 
that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. He's not going to tell you, I'm a wise person and you should listen to me. No, rather he's going to show you through his humble conduct that maybe you should listen to him. You see the wisdom and the understanding modeled in this man's life. Not because he has told you how smart and how wise and understanding he is, but because you see the fruit of his life. So James continues on. He says, if you have bitter envy, verse 14, and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing will be there. What are we not looking for as we think about men to serve as elders? We're not looking for men who are motivated by selfishness, a thirst for power, a desire to get their own way. That's not what we want. James says that kind of an attitude is from the devil. It's from the world. It is demonic. But, verse 17, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. That's the kind of man we're looking for. A man who shows, through the way he lives his life, his concern and his interest in the souls of others? Does he show care and concern for the well-being of others? If his actions display that, then that's the kind of man that we're looking for. Well, let me close with this final point. Suppose we have a man who who believes himself to be qualified. He's got a good heart. He has shown his interest in the well-being of others through his actions toward them. People in the congregation see those actions. They respect this man. He's very much appreciated for the quality person that he is. He wants to be chosen. And yet, for some reason, he wasn't. Why wasn't he chosen? I don't know. It, it could be any one of a number of reasons. But if you desire to serve in this way, and you feel that you're qualified and you're hopeful that it will work out because you want to, to, to serve the church in that way, it, you want to do it, and your heart is in the right place, and everything is coming from the, the best motivations, but you weren't chosen. The most important question, my friend, is not, why wasn't I chosen? The more important question is, what are you going to do now that you weren't chosen? What will your response be now that you haven't been chosen? Are you disappointed? Yes. But are you going to overcome that disappointment? and continue serving the Lord to the best of your abilities anytime you have an opportunity? Or are you going to let this cause you to withdraw, let your disappointment turn into bitterness, and just completely step away from the service of the Lord? What about justice? I don't mean J-U-S-T-I-C-E. I'm talking about a man in the Bible whose name was Justice. Just 
U.S., just us. Do you remember him? His story is in Acts chapter 1. So let's look at that together. Acts chapter 1. You'll remember that after Judas betrayed our Lord, the Gospels say that Judas went out and he hanged himself because of his guilt and his remorse. And so as we come to Acts chapter 1, Judas needs to be replaced. And there were two names that were put forth as potential replacements for Judas Iscariot. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 23, it says that they put forward two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. One of these two men is going to be selected, while the other is not. In verse 24, the text says that they prayed and they said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. They pray to God. And in verse 26, it says that they cast lots for this. And the answer that comes in verse 26 was Matthias. And he was added to the 11 apostles. Now, what's interesting about these two men is that they are never again mentioned in the New Testament. We know nothing else about these two men. But how did Justice feel after he had not been selected? Well, we'll never know the answer to that. There, there's nothing in Scripture that says one way or another. But do you think it is safe for us to assume this? Justice would not have been considered in the first place if he was not a quality person. Can we agree on that? I mean, we're not going to replace Judas Iscariot, who was a thief, with another thief. We're not going to replace Judas with somebody who didn't have character that was up to the task of being an apostle of Jesus Christ. And if justice really was a quality man, then our expectation would be that even after not being selected, he would continue being a quality man. He would continue serving the Lord in whatever capacity he could, even though he's not serving as an apostle. And brother, I want to tell you, if you are that man who desires to do this and your heart is in the right place and you feel that you are qualified, but you are not selected to the eldership, if you truly are the quality man who is described in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, then you will continue being that same kind of man, even though you weren't selected. And maybe with more time, one day you will be selected. Perhaps not. We don't know. But there will always, always be opportunities for God's people to serve and to serve well. So don't let this disappointment cause you to step back Set aside your apron. Stop serving the people of God. No, never do that. Serve with every opportunity that comes your way. As we close our lesson this morning, I, I want to say that as we begin this process imminently, to search for elders to work among our congregation. I want to urge you to start praying for this now. And I want you to pray regularly and fervently for this. 
There may be no more important decision that the local church makes than this. So what did the apostles do when it was time to replace Judas? They prayed. We will not be casting lots. Okay, frankly, I don't know what all that involves. I've read a lot about that, and I still don't know what that involves. We will not be doing that, but we will be praying about that. So can we do that right now? Let's pray together about this. Our Father above, we believe that your ways are best. We believe that, that your ways work, that your ways make us better as servants of Christ. And it is our desire as this local congregation of your people to do things your way. And Father, as we are soon to commence this process of selecting additional men to serve our congregation as elders, we pray that your hand of blessing and guidance would be with us. We recognize the importance of this, that leadership among your people, even from ancient times in the Old Testament and and the first century when the church had its founding, leadership among your people has been so important. And for so many years, whether it was Israel of old or churches of the Lord up till today, we recognize that there have been good leaders and there have been bad leaders. And we recognize that that the direction of the nation of Israel was determined by her leaders and that the direction and the peace and the harmony of local churches of the Lord Jesus are also greatly affected by leadership. We pray that we will look out among ourselves and that we will see good men who have dedicated their lives to you and to your service, men who have hearts of compassion and love for their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, men who have wives who support their work and their service, wives who are dedicated to the Lord Jesus as well, And because of that, they are servants who offer much to this local church. We pray that this process, soon to begin, would be one of peace. That this would not be, as so often is the case, unfortunately, a source of disagreement leading to division. But we want this to be something that unites us and makes us stronger as a church. Bless our three current elders. Bless the men who may be considered to join them as elders. And bless this church as we go through this process, which we believe is what you would have us to do as a church of your people. And we also believe is something that honors you in the name of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We are ready in just a moment to stand and sing an invitation song together. And our custom is to, at every service... Offer the invitation of God, the invitation of Christ Jesus to anyone who is not yet a Christian or to someone who needs to come back to the Lord and serve him with a fresh and renewed commitment. And if that is your need today, we invite you right now, come forward as we stand and sing together.